I think uh, as, a, as a macroeconomist, one of the uh, things I noted was this, this slow recovery, if it can be called that. Um, that's certainly something that we've all got to bear in mind in the next few years, especially in the developed world, are going to be really tough ones. And the markets that are going to grow are the, the brick, the emerging ones, and that's got to form a centerpiece of anybody's strategy. And the second thing is this focus on education and the cultural shift. I think it's so important that any policies and, and any rebalancing of the economy is not just driven by, by trade discussions and so forth, but there's a fundamental shift required, and especially this recognition of the engineer as mm. a worthy profession. I mean, uh, actually, the average uh, income of an engineer in the UK, a uh, chartered qualified engineer, is substantially more than the average income of a graduate in financial services. So actually, the problem is people don't know that engineering is a very rewarding career. And part of the reason is, of course, it's, I call it the celebrity culture, the lotto culture. Yes, a very small number of people in financial services win the lottery. The analogy is closer than you think. <laughs> and they earn huge amounts of money, which, of course, grab the headlines. And a lot of young people decide to buy a lottery ticket to see if they can become one of the very few people to win that huge reward, as opposed to perhaps um, settling for a less spectacular but much more likely outcome, <laughs> which is you know, nearly twice as much average income as an engineer than as a financial services worker. And that's putting aside the unemployed in media studies, you know, where we have 70,000 media studies graduates this year. Most of them aren't going to get a job let alone one in media studies. So I think that's, you know, engineering is actually, you know, a very worthwhile, well-rewarded, and it will in be increasingly well-rewarded as we, as we try to reconcile the mismatch between demand and supply. And I personally, I'm, I'm guilty of this with my own children. I've sent them all off to university. But actually, there is a huge fallacy, in my opinion, that the right thing to have been doing is to send more and more people to university. We've now got over 30% of people going to university. But actually, the right thing was to send more and more people to further education, to practical skills. And the problem is the status of that. Uh, I think the Transport Commission in Europe is one of the weakest commissions in Europe. It's not well resourced or well staffed. And some of the work they do is, um, you know, is not of the same quality as some of the work done by other commissions. However, I'm not really, really worried. This shift, this modal shift from away from cars to trains, is about as likely to happen in 2050 as it was when John Prescott aspired to a similar shift in this country about 10 years ago. 90% of all passenger kilometers take place in cars, 4% in trains, and 5% in buses, and a few people walk and cycle. Why? Because the car is by far the best value proposition for consumers. But if I look at it, the engineering issue or the 2030, 2050 issue itself, uh, it does come back down to, uh, to the same thing, which is uh, we need to be working with our young people. Do we, you know, if we look at the solutions of the, of the issues itself, it's about inspiration and education, isn't it? It's about really motivating our young people that this is the right uh, direction from the right uh, career, the right profession for them to choose. And whilst we're doing that, inspiring them and educating them on the facts, as Richard speaks about, then we have an opportunity to change their mind about the way the future or could be made or the future could be shaped itself. What are the things that persuade you that Britain is a good place to be in 5, 10, 15 years? And what are the, the, the things, apart from the European stuff that we've already talked about, what are the things that worry you? Well, well let's deal with the first thing. Obviously, we're not a low-cost country. Yeah. So anyway, we can't compete like that. So as Toyota, we're not trying to make very small cars here. We don't make the Igo here, we make it in the Czech Republic. Yeah. What, we're what we have to do here is make cars with high margin. Most of our, uh, and I used to work for another car maker that was mentioned earlier, so, so uh, I have some experience like that about that. But, but honestly speaking, most of our uh, heritage car making is now what we would call premium. So basically, it means a, a wider margin vehicle. And we have to compete in the same way. So the way we're doing that in Toyota and, and, and other Japanese-owned car makers are doing the same is we are focusing on low carbon. And our, our strategy is to have the most sustainable, lowest carbon manufacturing plant in Europe, making 
the lowest carbon <coughs> product. Where do we stand now in terms of, of what the government is, should be thinking about in terms of what's encouraged and what isn't when it comes to electric and hybrid? Um, so I'm very against the idea that electric cars get free parking or special favours. Um, I, I think they should be anything below so many grams gets these special favours. Um, the Department of Business, however, has... Are, are we moving in that direction, actually? I mean, it, what, we you already say have. Gets, yeah, we're, we're, we're beginning to... We already have, yes. I mean, actually, what governments have finally realised is that yeah. subsidising people to adopt technology, be it the early adopters of new technology, is very expensive. Giving them perks, just like we employees, by the way, is very cost-effective. It costs the government almost no money to allow you know, ultra-low carbon vehicles to occupy bus lanes or to park in, in uh, you know, otherwise restricted parking spaces. It's very, very cheap. But the customers value it enormously. And so it's a much more effective way of driving customer behavior than handouts and subsidies. I think the concept of, of clusters, yeah. um, and it's, it's, it's all already been proved here with, with the Formula One type image, the clustering of technologies and that um, bring, brings in not only the technologies but the skill sets as well. It all makes perfect common sense. And if you know that there's a, some strategy behind it that means in five years' time it's going to be so much bigger than it is at the moment, then it, yeah. it, it aids yeah. that confidence and it, it's, it sustains the growth. So.